Welcome everyone to the Remote Patient Monitoring Innovation Challenge Showcase. My name is Ella Schwartz and I am with the California Healthcare Foundation, an independent philanthropy that is dedicated to improving access to care and quality of care for low income and vulnerable communities in California. The team I'm on, the Health Innovation Fund, invests in emerging health technology companies that we believe can provide solutions to the pain points in the healthcare delivery system. And we work with health system partners on the ground, like providers and, par and payers, to adopt and scale innovative technology. I think we can all appreciate how challenging this year has been for healthcare, but that also opens an opportunity for innovation like telehealth and remote patient monitoring. Our provider and payer colleagues are concerned about engaging patients in virtual care. And it's particularly important that we engage patients with chronic health conditions like hypertension and diabetes. And it's imperative that we support patients that are disproportionately impacted like people of color. It seems like everyone is researching remote patient monitoring solutions right now. So we decided it's the right time to design this challenge and curate solutions. Before we dive in, I'd like to take a moment to thank the incredible team that designed this challenge. Over the past couple months, we worked with investor colleagues from Adaptation Health, Acumen America, and Health Equity Ventures to identify technology solutions that would be scalable and effective, especially in the safety net. We also engaged safety net providers and thought leaders from throughout California. Thank you to the incredible team from Northeast Valley Health Corporation, Petaluma Health Center, Shasta Community Health Center, and the Center for Care Innovations for your insight. Our design team identified four criteria that are integral to successful remote patient monitoring solutions. First, solutions should be culturally responsive. Second, technology should integrate with existing provider workflow and software like electronic health record. Third, companies should offer easy patient onboarding and engagement. And last in our criteria, the company should have experience working with safety net populations. So with all of that, we received almost 50 applications from innovative companies. And after a rigorous review, we are excited to introduce you to six companies today. We want you to be involved in today's event. Take a look inside the Zoom chat. You'll see a few resources. There's a welcome packet that gives you more details on each of the companies and presenters you'll meet today. There's also a short form in there if you want to connect with any of the companies that present directly. And we encourage you to ask questions throughout today's event. Please use the question and answer button in Zoom. Let us know who the question is for so we can direct it to them. And if we can't respond live, we'll follow up afterwards. And we're also recording this so that you can access it afterwards. Now, before we meet the companies, we're going to kick things off with an expert provider panel. Please welcome to the Zoom stage, a fantastic panel of safety net physicians. We've invited them here today to share how they are thinking about and using remote patient monitoring in their clinics. Welcome providers. Thank you. Dr. Edgar Chavez, Chief Executive Officer and Founder at Universal Community Health Center. Welcome Dr. Danielle Oren, Chief Medical Informatics Officer at Petaluma Health Center and Chief Medical Officer for the Redwood Community Health Coalition. And welcome Dr. Christine Braid, the Medical Director of Virtual Care Services at Dignity Health. I'd like to invite each of you to give a quick background on your health center, the populations that you serve, and your experience with remote patient monitoring or telehealth. Start with you, Dr. Chavez. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So. Um, as you said, I'm the CEO uh, of Universal Community Health Center. We're a small uh, community clinic uh, in Los Angeles, uh, fully funded FQHC. Uh, we uh, service mainly uh, the Latino underserved population of South LA, downtown Los Angeles. We have three clinics. Uh, we service about uh, 7,000 unique patients and we do 30 plus visits a year. Um, and uh, we, uh, we got into uh, telehealth really early on when the pandemic kicked off in March. Uh, and we have been using uh, the uh, um, telehealth to kick off our efforts to get to remote patient monitoring.
Great, Dr. Oren. Thanks and good morning. Um, I work for Petaluma Health Center. We're a federally qualified community health center in Northern California. We serve Southern Sonoma County and West Marin, which include both suburban and rural areas. We serve about 35,000 patients. We have a, about 110 providers that span primary care, behavioral health, dental, vision, eye care, wellness, and a tiny bit of specialty care. Um, we have four main sites, two school-based health centers, and one site at a homeless shelter. About half of our patients speak Spanish only. Um, and to date, we've dabbled in a little bit of remote patient monitoring and a few efforts around blood pressure cuffs that connect with our patient portal um, uh, using um, iPhones for transition of care for complex patients and um, diabetes blood sugar monitoring, continuous glucose monitoring systems and, and uh, attached monitors. Um, some of the barriers that our patients face have been connectivity, especially in the more rural areas of our community, affordability availab and availability of devices, um, tech and technical literacy, which we see both in the remote patient monitoring space and also in telehealth, and then um, language barriers, depending on what device or tool that we're using. But I think that there are definitely ways to overcome these challenges um, if we're intentionally looking to address them like we are today. And I think that's one of the things I'm most excited about today's demos for is the real focus on the safety net. Um, and um, I think that there might be, we may need to have many solutions to, to address all of our barriers or one solution that works for most and then um, an increased uh, amount of people power to really address the most vulnerable population. So excited to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you for that context. And we're glad that you're here as well. Dr. Bray, do you want to give a background? Sure. Um, I'm Christine Braid. I am medical director of virtual services for Dignity Health and also work with Common Spirit uh, for National. And um, I'm a family practice doc, and so um, so I have a lot of um, experience in the ambulatory and also in acute space as well. Um, our server, our population is a nonprofit, um, a large medical group that's integrated um, in ambulatory space and also in hospitals um, throughout California. Um, just in the Sacramento region, which is where I practice, there are 75,000 um, underserved lives that we, we service um, for uh, Sacramento area. Um, in the remote patient space, um, we've been actually doing quite a bit of remote patient monitoring for the years, a lot with chronic care conditions and um, diabetes, hypertension, um, uh, monitoring, CHF, and integrating that into ambulatory space. Um, for the acute, uh, we do uh, hospital home, um, ER transitions. And um, so we're looking at how can we balance that population across. Um, so I'm really interested in um, all of the, how we can expand to our underserved population. Very excited. And I, I really appreciate being here today. Great, such an expert group of family physicians. Thank you. Um, so our first question is for you, Dr. Oren. You actually served on the design team for this challenge, so thank you. And our question for you is, why is remote patient monitoring so relevant today? And why is cardiometabolic such a good place to start? Thanks. I, I think um, I would start by saying our, our previous model prior to COVID and prior to the um, use of telehealth so prominently in primary care wasn't really that great in terms of um, monitoring people with, with chronic illnesses. And many of the same patients, that uh, same barriers that face our patients in remote patient monitoring actually face them in remote, in uh, in-person care as well. And there were some additional barriers, transportation, affordability of office visits, um, the fact that there may not be office visits available at every health center at every time. Um, so I think we're really familiar with those, with those barriers too. And I, I'm not sure that interacting with people two to three times a year um, who have uncontrolled chronic diseases like high blood pressure or diabetes is really the most effective care for those people. And I think um, 
there's an, a real opportunity here for us to do something different. Um, around cardiometabolic care specifically, there is some urgency around this because of the pandemic. We have many people who are avoiding in-person care. So we're going from um, intermittently monitoring them two to three times a year to um, basically none at all, which definitely puts people at risk for either going from a controlled chronic illness to uncontrolled or uncontrolled to having an event. Um, and it definitely has the potential to worsen outcomes. Um, and because these problems are really so prevalent, um, it really just lights a fire under all of us in terms of really needing to address this. I think it's also worth thinking about, and we all know from our personal experience that the stress of the pandemic has really affected people's lifestyles as well. And so we know that in addition to not being monitored, people might not be eating as healthy, they might not be exercising unless they're their pandemic activity was to start an exercise program. But I can say from my experience speaking with my own patients, that's not all that common. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, again, that there definitely is some urgency around this. In, in a model with less in-person care, uh, heart disease, high blood pressure, and diabetes are pretty much impossible to monitor if the patient doesn't have home equipment. Um, and doesn't know how to use it. So as my own health center shifted into majority primary care being delivered in telehealth, one of the first things we noticed was how few people had a blood pressure monitor and how difficult it was even if they did to get these measurements and to get them into the EHR and have it um, integrate into our regular workflow and system of care. So we, we quickly realized that if we're gonna deliver high quality of care virtually, we have to find ways to provide monitors to provide education and guidance on how to use them and how to get systems in place that would get the information back to the care team and into the electronic care, uh, health record, sorry. Um, I think that we do have, a, a, as I said at the beginning, we have an amazing opportunity here as we have transitioned to telehealth to increase the access to good care by providing information and guidance to patients where they are and when they need it that can really overcome some of the barriers that we really faced in in-person care. Um, I think we have the possibility of preventing more cardiovascular events by monitoring patients more closely, having more measurements, adjusting medications and care plans uh, and goals as needed rather than at these couple times when we happen to get to see the patient. Um, and lastly, and, and maybe most importantly, we can really help patients engage with their own health information and increase their self-management um, of these chronic conditions. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that context and totally appreciate, you know, given the geography of your health center and the diversity of your patient population, that this is a really exciting opportunity. So we're really grateful for those comments. Um, in a follow-up, um, a question for Dr. Chavez, um, remote patient monitoring is going to generate new streams of data. Why is this information important for your practice and how do you prepare to manage this influx of new data? Uh, thank you for that question. So um, as I said earlier, we uh, springboarded telehealth to try to do remote patient monitoring because of the nature of how it's reimbursed. There is no real reimbursement for, F, uh, for FQHCs because of the way that we get paid. And so there was a huge barrier for us to even get started. But once telehealth started and we started connecting with patients, uh, we really quickly jumped on board to uh, deploy a remote patient monitoring program. And we called it the analog uh, remote patient monitoring program, where we essentially bought a whole bunch of these uh, non-connected, very inexpensive blood pressure monitors. And so we started like uh, the other presenter who started with blood pressure and we sent them out to people and we gave them all these uh, sheets where they would write the, uh, the information and then they would either drop it off at our clinic or they would take pictures and send them to us. But we very quickly found that this type of data gathering was not very efficient. We couldn't get it very easily into our electronic medical record. And uh, it was hard to, um, to get people to actually do this. We had to call them, make sure that they wrote it down. And so there was a lot of barriers uh, on this, what we call analog Manila program. And so we uh, started searching for a solution that would be a little bit more digital where 
people would get uh, connected at home with a device and then the device will collect information and send it back to either a portal where we could easily just export that to our EMR or directly to the, to the EMR. And so we, we started connecting with different uh, places and it's really difficult to find somebody that wants to work directly with your EMR. Everybody has a portal, everybody has a, a service and the service is really expensive. And so uh, for us, that, that, you know, uh, that was a huge barrier. And so luckily, uh, because of what's happening with COVID, there's a lot of grants that came on board and we started uh, getting some funding to, to get some of these uh, companies to work with us. And so we started a, a program with a, uh, with a company um, and now it's uh, fully deployed. And these uh, um, devices are now um, uh, digital uh, they're sending them to fish. In, in some cases, you know, somebody mentioned that there's a lot of barriers with uh, connections, with internet, right? And so a lot of the times you want to give this, these uh, connected devices to patients, but they don't have Wi-Fi, they don't have internet, they don't have anything that would connect that device and send the data. So you're back to being analog, right? So one of the solutions is some of these blood pressure devices have their own LTE so that they could collect that data. So this company allows us to sort of be flexible with what the patient has at home so that we're able to collect those that, that information. And so now that we're starting to see the data coming uh, electronically into our portal and then to our medical record, we have developed a team of uh, providers that will look at that data and um, uh, the system alerts us when that data is at a range so that we're able to uh, have meaningful actions for that patient. Hey, your blood pressure is going out of whack. Let's bring you in. And so one of the things that we're trying to, to do to sustain the program in the future, because the funding's not going to be here forever, especially, you know, hopefully they will change the rules for remote patient monitoring. But if they don't, one of the things that we hope to do is that uh, doing this data sort of uh, evaluation is going to generate some visits that are billable so that we can sustain the remote patient monitoring program. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing the insight on tracking all of that data in your internal workflow. Um, Dr. Braid, we're going to jump over to you. Um, can you tell us a bit about how remote patient monitoring fits into a larger health system like Common Spirit? And how do you use remote patient monitoring to support your best clinical practice and quality improvement? Sure. Um, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, so when we think of a, a big system, you know, one of the difficult things that we have is, is that continuum of care through uh, and discussion with, pa with patients and physicians. So as we grow and as we combine, um, Common Spirit is actually two very large um, corporations coming together and we don't have the same medical records, uh, even close to the same medical record system. So how do we talk to each other? So virtual um, has been a really unique place where we can start to exchange information, kind of like we are here today. We're all together, though we're all in remote locations, so it's kind of cool. And, um, and one of the pieces that we're starting to use to really keep that continuum of care, particularly from a hospital space, uh, to a post-hospital space like um, uh, home health into the ambulatory space is remote patient monitoring. So we're using um, RPM as a tool to watch the patient while they're in an acute space, keep set of the vitals, communicate with the physicians, then as they go into a home health, keep the same remote patient monitoring, hopefully, or at least the tool of remote patient monitoring so that at home health, the nurses can continue to watch the patient. And then when we go back into the ambulatory space for the, the chronic care condition to continue with the patient. And again, if that's something that we could implement while they're in the hospital, um, then we can arm them with the tools um, to keep at home. So we're not relying on them to have to come into my clinic to pick it up or there, you know, if we can do it at the site of the hospital. Um, our hospitals here in um, Dignity in the California area um, are uh, the, the sisters, um, uh, the, Mer the Mercy sisters, um, we actually have a charitable uh, need and they actually are great into the giving and help um, our, our patients that cannot um, pay for the remote services. So that's something that we're looking to access. Um, so again, this is something when you, when you came, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is right in the line of our, our um, philosophies and of our giving in our company. So I was very excited. 
And, um, but the, you know, when we're thinking of connecting the patient, and so one of the things I, I usually try to explain to my physicians is, you know, there's only one patient. I said, so, so when we're going from hospital to my office, um, sometimes it gets disconnected. Um, so my hospitalist is taking care of the patient and then my home health takes care of the patient, but the patient's getting jumbled around. So if we can use virtual, um, particularly RPM as something that keeps that patient feeling like they're always complete. Um, so I, as the primary care physician, can always understand what's happening and the patient is always in good communication with their provider. Um, I think that's a goal. Um, so that's where I feel like is the, the future of where we can go and we're, we're there um, and we can really pull these, this huge corporation together and make it feel very family, very home, very connected so that we're back to our little doctor's office um, and um, that the patient feels like that they have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with their, their physician again and not part of this massive corporation that um, they got lost in, so. Great, thank you. That's an exciting model around continuity of care. We're so grateful to all three of you, um, early adopters and champions of remote patient monitoring and telehealth. Thank you for sharing your perspectives um, at this in this panel. Um, and I, I know from experience that the three of you on this call are some of the most innovative providers and part of very innovative health systems in California. So thank you for being here with us.